Is our reality a quantum hologram? What if the truth about life after death lies waiting to be discovered in the basement of a haunted house? Are we connected to galactic civilizations? I lie awake at night thinking about these things. I never miss an opportunity to ask bigger questions. If you like what we're doing, subscribe here on YouTube. If you'd like to go deeper, see more original content, all commercial free, go to iVolveTV.com and become a subscriber. We're repurposing the purpose of media, and we want you to join us. Hi, I'm Ron James, and this is another edition of Bigger Questions. I'm here in the studio with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. She's the author of over 60 books covering a wide variety of topics, and we're about to talk about some of her favorites. Rosemary, thanks for being here. Ron, it's a pleasure to be back with you again. So, it's been about a year since you were here before, and you were also here recently when we were working with Paul Davidson, met at his house, uh, the Forey Ackerman Mansion, um, with the Life After Death Project. We talked a little bit about that. What's, uh, what's on your radar screen right now? All kinds of projects in all areas. I've been working in demonology, in afterlife research, spirit communication, entity contact experiences. And uh, one of my uh, new areas of research, new as in the past few years, and one that I'm continuing to emphasize and expand, is what I call transreality earth. That is the collective changing of human consciousness uh, in part driven by our extraordinary experiences, paranormal phenomena and entity contact, that is changing the nature of human consciousness, which in turn is changing reality. So it's a look at how our world uh, is going to grow and develop, how reality is going to change, and also ask questions like, how are we going to stay in charge of that? So give us a couple examples of scenarios that play into that definition. I do believe that there is an increase in people having uh, haunting experiences, ghosts and apparitions, sightings of mysterious creatures, mystery lights in the sky, landed craft, alien contact, more people having direct face-to-face -face interaction with uh, what broadly could be called non-human intelligent beings because we don't really know if they're extraterrestrial or interdimensional where exactly they come from. And these experiences really change and transform a person's worldview. And not only that, uh, the very nature of having experiences further makes an individual more likely to have additional experiences, like out-of-body experiences, even near-death experiences. As a result, human beings start uh, changing their views on the afterlife, survival, whether or not there's reincarnation. Uh, where we fit into the cosmic scheme of things, especially with these other beings, and also it changes how they live their lives and the values by which they live their lives. Now this expansion of consciousness gets into very subtle areas because these things are around us all the time and we don't experience them on a daily basis. They're not part of our ordinary reality. But it's my prediction, and it has been the pred prediction of many philosophers and mystics and adepts uh, going back way before me, that these expansions in consciousness uh, will change the way we relate to reality in general. That is, what is extraordinary now will become ordinary in the future. And certain things will have to change as a result of that. For example, the physical body. The physical body is oriented toward five physical senses. Well, all of these experiences involve uh, the sixth sense. It's the ability to see and experience and know beyond the five senses. And if we have more and more of those experiences that are expanding non-local consciousness, then how will our physical body actually change? This would be the light body or the ascension body that uh, esoteric philosophers have addressed uh, in the past. And I think that's the direction we're going in. But it has 
dangers on, uh, along the way. And we are in global mind now. We have global mind, global thought forms that happen every day because of the internet, because of global media trending things in social media. And so we form these collective thought forms that have a great deal of energy and an impact on reality in the physical environment. Well, naturally, this is a power that is ripe for manipulation. And so if uh, there is such a thing as conspiracy, if there are governments, organizations, corporations, individuals, military uh, interests, that want to manipulate this power, uh, this global power, then uh, they're going to use global thought form and media to do it. And I think that is happening already. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a, a good case for that. There's a lot of people saying it. You've covered so much ground just in that answer that I kind of want to back up just a little bit and talk about some of the points that you've hit upon because they're all very profound. So. We have a situation, and I'm often uh, saying it, that the two most profound questions facing humanity are, are we alone in the universe and is there life after death? And once those answers are um, established to the point where there's no room for conjecture anymore, that that will fundamentally alter the way we live on the planet, the way we interact with each other, and the way we look at our own existence. And it sounds as if you're echoing that philosophy in the first part of your answer. Well, absolutely, Ron. And there have been many attempts in the past by afterlife researchers to provide the evidence that the afterlife exists with the belief that that truth would fundamentally change the nature of society. And I think that they were right, you're right, um, but we have a disconnect when it comes to that. First of all, the evidence tends to be very subjective. And a lot of the hard evidence is very easy for scientists to pick apart because uh, trying to replicate statistical uh, facts and hard evidence about the afterlife. From an experiential from standpoint. Ex from yes. an experiential standpoint, that, and the technology we have is very unreliable, produces interesting results, but it is unreliable, uh, makes it easy for people to dismiss. And what researchers have found in the past that even if they had something that was really solid and tantalizing and good, that instead of being uh, fascinated and awestruck as they anticipated the public would be, the public has an avoidance factor. It's like, well, intellectually, we give lip service to wanting to know, but when push comes to shove, we'd rather not know. And I think it's because people are deep down inside afraid that the truth will be something they cannot handle because of their religion, their culture, their personal beliefs. So we want to know that there is such a thing as survival, but what if the evidence contradicts what we hope it will be or what we've been taught it will be? That's really a hard hurdle to get past. But you know, we're going to get there. Technology is going to improve to the point where we will have more reliable uh, two-way communication with the afterlife. Um, we're going to have a merging of, of science and philosophy that will give us a scientific underpinning uh, for uh, the existence of the afterlife. And we will have uh, the proof that um, human beings have looked for throughout history that will change society. Uh, then um, the interesting thing also about some of our extraordinary experiences, it also points to an afterlife connection. And in the research that I have been doing with the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Experiences, uh, in, in which we've done a global survey, a very large uh, data sample of experiencers about their, not just ET experiences, but extraordinary experiences across the board. And many people have responded vol uh, that voluntarily that they believe that their encounters with non-human intelligent beings or extraterrestrials um, have to do with the afterlife, that there is some connection between uh, the connection with, with these intelligences and the existence of the afterlife and what goes on there. You know, it's interesting because there is, are distinctions drawn very often in our fields where people that are interested in the ET phenomenon are not really as focused on life after death. And the people are very specialized in their interests in paranormal. And I'm always saying, and I've heard you say, that all of these topics dovetail into each other. 
And so you were just talking about that. Can you elaborate on that a little more? They are interconnected. And th this was a, a, a truth that was apparent to me from the beginning of my involvement in these fields. And I've been doing this work full time for over 30 years now. And it is uh, good to see so many of the researchers uh, over the years coming to the same conclusion that uh, our interests and our experiences are not defined in a narrow way. You don't have just ET experiences. You don't have just NDE experiences. And in fact, when we sit down with experiencers and interview them, it's a very complex life history that begins to unfold, usually from a very early age. And some people have more experiences than others. I think it's the way their consciousness is naturally attuned, and perhaps some of the interests that they have as well. But um, uh, the average person is likely to have a variety of extraordinary experiences throughout their lives. So how do all, are all of these things interconnecting and where are they taking the, the human being, the individual, in terms of their life journey, their expansion of consciousness? And this is all adding to a collective. So we're in a phase now that is really a renaissance because it's, it's a whole new frontier opening up. And uh, there's a, a positive side to that and there's a negative side to that. Everything has its light and dark uh, flip sides. And the, the dark side of that is chaos. There's chaos, uncertainty, disconnect, manipulation, confusion, uh, people struggling to just to ha hold their lives together in the face of what they feel are formidable odds or things that they can't control. And on the positive side of that is this push toward uh, exploration of consciousness, technology and science are taking us in that direction, people's experiences are going in that direction, and the media interest is following that as well. So all of these things are combining uh, into this alchemical uh, mix, this combustible mix that I think is going to break us into literally a new world. As the paranormal, so to speak, becomes normal, you were talking about this almost apathetic, almost fear-based uh, reason why people aren't receptive to this knowledge. Because to me, I don't understand why people aren't rallying in the streets for the truth about the ET issue. I don't understand why people are meandering through their lives without exploring the deepest questions facing humanity. It's so easy to get caught up and manipulated into, you know, let's watch the football game on Sunday and let's buy, 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 consume, 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 and worry about how we're going to sustain it all. And it seems like there are forces that have an interest in keeping humanity in that place. Who's pulling the puppet strings and what is the darker agenda? I don't think it's any one single outfit. I think there are multiple forces at work, some in cooperation with each other and some in competition with each other, and that they do involve non-human life forms. I think there are intelligent beings that have been involved in the history of humanity and the development of it from the get-go. And uh, uh, some of the major players from on the entity side of things are the jinn. Uh, they've uh, shared the planet with us. Uh, they were here before us. Uh, they don't have the domination over the planet that they used to have. They're very stealthy shapeshifters, and they're very capable of creating a lot of trouble. And uh, this is a widely held belief around the world that they are engaged in all kinds of human affairs that are on these big political fronts and man manipulation kinds of fronts uh, in terms of keeping human beings distracted by chaos, by turmoil, by uh, on an individual level attaching themselves to people to influence thoughts, health, uh, the direction of life. And uh, one of the... the but to what end? What, what are they trying to accomplish? Well, here again, I don't think there's any single agenda going on. We have multiple agendas on the So planet. are there there's different gen that are operating for different masters? Well, they are organized under kingships, and they're as varied as human beings. You oh, know, okay. Uh, we, right. we, we have the good, the bad, and the ugly among us. Sure. We have the trickster and the terrorist and the bully, and yet uh, we can't categorize ourselves in general by any of those labels. Now when we talk about the jinn, are we talking about, because there's all kinds of different invisible entities with this parasitic element throughout different cultures and different mythos, so is the jinn comparable to demons or comparable to archons or comparable to any of these other entities that are said to exist? Or are they their own, uh, their own thing? 
They are their own thing. They, they are a race of beings the same as we are, but they are very masterful shapeshifters and they can acquire just about any form that uh, they want to take in order to further their ends, which are many and there are many motives. I've been studying them now for over a decade and I see multiple agendas at work. Uh, some of them uh, are, are just very self-serving. They want to engage with human beings for their own benefit, take the life force from us. There are many ways to do that. We're a source of entertainment, sexual pleasure. Um, some of them play with us like a cat would a mouse. Others are more hostile. Uh, they're more like the, uh, the criminal uh, element in uh, human society and some of them are like human terrorists. They don't like us, in fact they even hate us and they would like to see us eradicated. So their, their motives would be uh, to the detriment and destruction of human beings. Uh, there are some that uh, have indicated that they feel that they should reclaim the wor a world that we live in because it was originally theirs. It's like we would feel if someone took our homeland from us. And uh, others uh, feel that they can, uh, that their objective is to move in on human society and subjugate us and use us in various ways. The taking of the life force is uh, a way of feeding off of us. And uh, stimulating chaos and violence around the world for bloodshed is another way of taking the life force as well. So all of these things then get fit into human agendas and uh, it's the uh, controlling uh, human beings who are power hungry, uh, greedy, and um, want to assert their own agendas uh, for whatever purpose, whether it's to acquire something or acquire more of something or to use human beings as uh, a subjugated uh, element of society, all of these things are at play and some of them in competition with, with each other. So, okay, so we have the evolving human consciousness mm -hmm. that seems to have a life force and a trajectory of its own. Then we have darker entities and presences that have their own agenda for humanity and are manipulating us in a variety of ways, but they don't seem to have any kind of ultimate power to create an ultimate ending or an ultimate completion of an agenda. They just seem to have a certain amount and they are balanced by the positive forces and there are forces of light that have a more positive outlook for the destiny of humanity. So let's talk about that. Well, the forces of light are many too, and we can call on them for help as well. And uh, uh, these would be like angelic beings and highly evolved beings from other realities. Uh, uh, afterlife researchers have been in contact with a lot of these uh, types of beings who are really more of a collective than individuated beings. And uh, some of them uh, describe themselves as uh, high levels of vibration. They don't even have a form that we could relate to. Mm -hmm but they have an interest in helping humans make these bridges to uh, expanded consciousness and also bridges of communication such as into the afterlife. Uh, so this sort of work has been going on on a high-tech way for many decades now and due to the human ridicule factor uh, that we touched on earlier about mm -hmm. do human beings really want to know if there right. is such a thing as the afterlife a lot of this work now goes on very privately and even very quietly because the researchers have discovered that when they bring their findings uh, to the public and to the media they are a automatically debunked uh, automatically ridiculed and people just tend to not want to know it's uh, it's a truth that they say they want to know, but then they really do not want to know. So um, there have been efforts in the past to have human and, and otherworldly being consortiums and cooperations and, and collaborations, and they haven't held together very well, uh, mainly because of the shortcomings of human beings. These beings have always emphasized that if we are going to better ourselves, if we are going to expand into this enlightened new world, that we have to do so from the standpoint of unconditional love in the heart, sincerity, and there's no ego in it. it this is not a for-profit thing. We all have to earn a living. Uh, that's the way, uh, way of the world uh, for human beings. But there's a difference between profiteering and making your livelihood. So uh, the natural tendency of, of human beings in, in any promising endeavor is for a darker side of humanity to come in and want to profit from it, want to manipulate it, want to control it, 
and uh, or want to get some ego satisfaction out of it and that's where energetically these things start to fall apart. So when you look back at you know some of the older um, traditional religious teachings, it, it tells us that you know there's a God in heaven and a devil in hell and that they we are basically uh, proxies for their war. And then when we look at these more uh, evolved modern philosophies and understandings that like what you've talked about, then we see that really it's the same thing. We've managed to identify the players a little better and we've managed to put different um, names and different shapes on all of the different entities that are involved in it, but it's still the same thing. So is the human existence really just as proxy pawns for greater forces to play out their rivalries? Well, there are certainly people who feel that way, that we were uh, created uh, by uh, other races of beings for the purpose of our usefulness to them uh, as a labor force, as a food source, uh, as an experiment. And uh, I, I've never really fully believed that myself. I think human beings have as much autonomy, free will, and sovereignty in this uh, greater cosmic scheme of things as any other being. Uh, and even if there were other beings who were, were engaged in uh, genetic manipulation for humanity or, or did something to uh, alter the course of our history uh, through technology and knowledge and that sure. sort of thing, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have uh, the right to free will and sovereignty and, and autonomy. And yet uh, there are these forces, I think, that would like to uh, turn us into some sort of labor pool or food source or, or, or again an experiment. Now the, the danger that I see happening through technology is our addiction to technology. All the good things that technology bring, brings us through uh, the ability to know more, to have more information than at any time in history at your disposal, at your fingertips, at your cell phone. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. The instant communication, the way we can connect through all of this wonderful technology is, is absolutely astounding. And yet, it's addictive. And here again, we have uh, the awareness from uh, manip manipulative forces and parties, governments, organizations. The downside of technology uh, is that it can be addictive. It is addictive, and we're seeing that now uh, with uh, people being addicted to their cell phones. Uh, we have tens of thousands of people, and probably hundreds of thousands of people, who um, cannot go more than a few seconds, a few minutes, without consulting their, their phone for something, or tweeting, or texting. Uh, or looking something up. It's like we, we can't focus anymore on tasks at hand. Uh, our attention span is getting shorter and shorter. And this is a distraction that is literally uh, disconnecting us from each other. It seems to me that, you know, when I think about that, that perhaps we're almost being bred to be some sort of bio interface for some advanced technology that we don't even know about. Like, like the whole planet is going to be some kind of informational processing node. You see things happening to the human genome like autism popping up in more and more people and you see the addiction to technology <clears throat> and it's not, hard to, uh, it's not hard to envision that when we first started the World Wide Web, we had no idea that we were signing on to something that was one day going to be able to contain every element of our lives um, within, its, within its grasp and, and somehow control us without even controlling us. And it's an interesting postulation that there is a, uh, there's an agenda of force here that is getting us more and more integrated with this technology and then we have the ability to integrate physically with pieces of technology where the human being of the future will probably be enhanced in many technological ways. So you can see that possibly going somewhere that's a little spooky. It's a downright scary and one of the things that I have to keep considering in all of this is uh, are we in a matrix-like scenario? Uh, I'm absolutely convinced. The uni I, I, you know, because I've been studying this for a long time, and the universe um, works in the same way that a computer would function. If you if you are able to shed your perception of what a computer is by getting rid of the fact that it has to be this box running on power. Um, and you get into what a quantum computer can be, basically an energetic computer that is capable of performing unlimited numbers of tasks, then you have the, the energetic core of the universe functioning through a set of mathematical formulas that create the laws of physics, and then we have us that, that come in. It's, it's, 
the, re the realities that we are creating within our own computers, within our, our own computer games, are extraordinarily similar to the reality that we're living in. And now, <clears throat> they're beginning to find glitches in the matrix, little things where the reality can cheat. The quantum photosynthesis is, is an example. We probably are living in a matrix. In fact, it's almost, it, we, science all agrees now, this table's not solid. It's an illusion created by vibrating energy around an energetic framework. Our minds are perceiving this. They are the transcoder that interprets this, in, this energy into a solid object. So I think the question as to rather we're living in some sort of a matrix is almost to the point where the body of evidence is overwhelming, even, even if it forces you to change your perception of what a matrix is. And so ultimately the, the question just has to become why? And we don't even know who the Oz is behind the curtain, that if we are in this matrix, well, who's manipula manipulating all of this behind the scenes? Exactly. And we don't know. Uh, we know who some of the players are, but are they the manip manipulators or is somebody working their strings as well? And I, I've certainly wondered that when I've looked at gin interactions with mm -hmm. human beings, that um, there are some who feel that um, they account for all of these supernatural things going on. And I, I don't think they do. They're capable of um, participating in that and mimicking things. But are they the ones really uh, causing all of these extraordinary experiences and phenomena? Uh, or is there something else behind them? And uh, this is territory that human beings have to explore. One of the problems, another one, I should say, another one of the problems that we're facing now is uh, we have a Trojan horse scenario going on because we have been so distracted by economic blow-ups and failures and collapses, by uh, global uh, conflict, by epidemics, by distressing news all the time that's sucking up our attention and draining us. And then we're given the distraction of technology addiction that this enables a lot of things to go on underneath the surface to insinuate themselves uh, into us, into society, into, into humanity as a whole without us being aware. And this is a real Trojan horse situation. And I think that we have those elements going on now. Um, and we've uh, got manipulation of the food chain. You just mentioned autism, how that has skyrocketed. And certain kinds of cancers have skyrocketed. Uh, I believe that, that these things are experiments in many levels, that there mm -hmm. are certain agents introduced into society in the form of uh, genetically, now genetically modified food, uh, toxic, increasingly toxic medications pushed at us every day uh, on the media that have horrible side effects uh, and that seem to be just uh, a part of it's a part of the whole scenario. It's, it's like... It's, a, it's the entire control mechanism just getting more and more advanced and more and more efficient. And vaccines now that are, are not uh, uh, being uh, voluntary in so many places anymore, they're being required. And uh, uh, pretty soon I think we'll probably have implants and chips that will monitor our movements. We'll, uh, we're becoming like the Borg. There's a concept that has been kind of hovering in my consciousness for a while. I call it some other purpose. And what that means is that um, if you look at almost everything that is alive, almost everything that exists, it somehow serves a purpose that it is completely unaware of. In other words, the flower does not have an awareness that its purpose is to pollinate other flowers and to feed the bees. Beings are on a trajectory, perceiving their existence, living their lives, unaware that they are serving some other purpose. You start talking about all these things that are happening to humans and all the different players that are affecting us, but we're still having our human experience. So it's a very delicate balance, but it seems as though we are going along our own human trajectory, developing our own consciousness, living and dying without ever really being aware of any of these other things that are at play. So we're having our own existence, but we're also serving some other purpose. And it's, it's, it's masterful in the way it, it plays out. It's almost like a ballet of existence with all of these moving parts working in such a way that everything is getting what it needs. We, we do not have this sense that we are being influenced or controlled. We have this sense that we are completely autonomous going through our lives. Well, all of these other things are at play. And when you look at the way things work, it's almost as though 
that is by design and that that is the way existence works within this universe and within this multiverse. Well, I, I, that's a very interesting scenario and I, I think that uh, there's a lot of validity to it. Um, and there is a greater purpose uh, and interconnection of things that we're, uh, for the most part, barely aware of. And uh, this is how consciousness is changing. It is changing in the direction of becoming aware of this and our participation in a greater scheme of things. And uh, we are at this crossroads where uh, we're either going to uh, be in the driver's seat or we're going to be driven. And uh, we need to learn a lot about who these other players are, what a lot of these agendas are. Uh, we need to not be afraid of these kinds of experiences. And, and yet we get fear fed back to us by religion, mm -hmm. uh, even by science and uh, certainly the entertainment industry, but um, people aren't going, going to you know, be entertained unless they're afraid, so there's that element. But uh, we're taught to fear certain things. And I see this all the time in the paranormal investigations I do, and when people have some sort of extraordinary experience, even if it's been a positive experience, it shakes them up uh, many times in a very fearful way because uh, suddenly the foundation of life shifts. It's like being in an earthquake. And uh, then you're in totally new territory. And so you either deny the experience uh, or you accept it and integrate it and you are changed by it. And uh, uh, so we've got all of these colliding forces going on of manipulation, of uh, other beings trying to help us or hinder us, uh, human beings, beings trying to sort their way through the, uh, the rigors of daily life as well as all of these esoteric things. And uh, it's quite a challenge. But if some of us don't hold the torch, if some of us don't keep uh, holding uh, you know, a higher light and um, providing information and insight into what's really going on, I think we, we have uh, a real danger of a lot of backsliding. And uh, that would be very bad for, for humanity. We've had periods of darkness in uh, human history, um, t three steps forward, two steps back, but uh, this would be quite serious for us if, uh, if we are not able to be in control of our destiny. Do you think ultimately, despite all of the things that are at play, that we, we really do self-determine? Because there's, there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of people that are addressing these things with, you know, philosophically, and they're saying that, that, yeah, well, we have all these, uh, the dark cabal and all the different forces that are um, trying to play out an agenda for mankind. We have the light beings that are trying to help us to develop, and really we are the ultimate determining factor. Our collective consciousness, however it evolves, they can try to influence us, but they can't control us. <clears throat> Despite everything that we're up against, our collective consciousness will be what determines our outcome. Do you, do you agree with that? I, I believe that fundamentally, bottom line, human beings do have free will and self-determination. And that this is um, a fundamental part of our being and a fundamental right. I believe it is a fundamental right of beings throughout uh, creation. And so we can be in control. Um, we, we can... Um, determine our own our own destiny but we give our power away very easily and we have throughout history we give it away to each other mm -hmm. uh, and then we give it away to uh, beings that uh, we consider to be more powerful or intelligent or better than we are and that's how we automatically look at, at um, any alien being uh, as something that's mightier than we are. This is the reason why we have gods and demigods uh, and in fact I've, I've often made the comment that uh, if, uh, if, a, if a jinn wanted to really manipulate and control a lot of people, they would just uh, set themselves up as a god because uh, then people would give their power away to that, to that being. Uh, in that respect, uh, religion can be quite a hindrance. And then with all the dogma, the uh, baggage that sure. religion has along with it. Uh, one of the, the things that I really liked about uh, the mystical philosophy of Sri Aurobindo, who is one of my favorite uh, mystics, is that in the integral yoga that he developed over the course of his career, uh, 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 which is about the spiritualization of matter, it's about bringing divine down into the matter, into the very cells of consciousness. Um, and uh, he said there's no need for religion, it really hinders all of our progress. 
And uh, uh, when I speak to experiencers and interview them, many of them will make a distinction between being spiritual and being religious. And uh, they want to actually uh, emphasize that they are not religious, but mm -hmm. they consider themselves to be very spiritual. So religion has a lot to lose in this expansion of consciousness. And uh, science, I think, uh, science is kind of trailing behind experiencers because people are having experiencers that don't conform to science. And it's a truth, it's a fundamental truth uh, that they take into their, their world view. And they have to leave science and religion behind. Uh, and where science is going to fit into the picture in the long run, I'm not really certain myself. But I religion have hopes for stands science. to be. Uh, I, I'm optimistic for science too, and and uh, so many scientists are now trying to address the paraphysical realities. And is there a quantum uh, reality that explains and incorporates everything? But religion really does have a lot to lose. Well, the thing is, is that we know that there is a reality that explains everything. The problem is they haven't been able to have it make sense by the scientific standard. That's exactly it. And so we have a situation where we have the experiencers, like we were talking about out in the lobby. We have a situation where we have the experiencers, we have the believers, and we have the scientific community that has to have everything proven by a very rigorous set of standards. And all of them are saying something different, and in a large part, they're poo-pooing each other. And that is a fundamental underpinning of why we have such a dysfunctional society. It's not the only reason, but it's an illustration, is that we have an entire species that can speak the same languages, understand each other's words, but cannot get on the same page. And so I think there needs to be a broader openness. Uh, there needs to be different ways to define things to make them scientifically valid. And we need to look at, you know, how are we really going to prove this stuff? The science has made a lot of uh, <clears throat> really good steps in this whole life after death thing with the acknowledgement that perhaps consciousness can survive the brain. There are theories now that support how that's possible, and it's really interesting to see that science is saying, well, okay, maybe, because they weren't saying that 20 years ago. They weren't saying it 10 years ago. They were saying when the brain dies, <clears throat> consciousness dies, that's the way it is. But now because of... Um, developments in holographic universe theory and quantum physics, they're saying, well, wait a minute, maybe that information can be cataloged outside of the human brain, which therefore would make it um, transcend the death of the physical body. So there's science now having wording for life after death. And so there's hope. There's, ho there's hope that we are going to arrive at a whole new understanding of our world based on what we can prove having a lot more in common with what we know in our hearts and what we see with our eyes and hear with our ears. Unfortunately, um, society does not give the scientists who want to explore these things the freedom to do so. And um, many of the scientists have, have to wait until their academic and professional careers are, are over, they're in retirement, before they can make public uh, comments and do the research that really intrigues them. Uh, and it's, uh, to me, it's, it's puzzling that they, they have to keep these things almost under wraps uh, until it's safe for them to do so, when science should be out in, in the front, uh, really pushing out the boundaries instead of trying to hold on to um, older, you know, more rigid views. But I, I still run... The old run, paradigms, the old realities. I still run into a lot of scientists who deny non-local consciousness, all of these paraphysical phenomena and experiences. Mm -hmm. It's all... Um, it's not even imagination, because we need the imagi imagination faculty to have the experience. Absolutely. But it's fantasy to them. It's hallucination. You made it up. You know, it's wish fulfillment or whatever. And they just dismiss it out of hand. Uh, so um, we've, we've got, uh, you know, polar opposites that are, are, are still in conflict. But I do agree with you that uh, over recent years, we've had a lot of very positive movement in that direction with more scientists at least allowing for the possibility. There, there's light on the horizon. Yes. Yeah. There, the, you know, the fusion of science and spirit is, a, is an almost fundamental key to successful human evolution. It's, it, 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 once that is accomplished, rather something else comes in and forces it to be accomplished via other means, or rather scientific discovery in human endeavor, and the experience of those who are coming from a place of knowing really do fuse into real um, discernible and documented data, that's up in the air. But 
the need for it to happen is undeniable. And there, I've talked to people, um, Mike Barrow was here and we talked about this, and he says there's just no way, it's never gonna happen. Science is never going to give us <clears throat> the things that we believe in in a scientifically documentable way. And so it seems as though we're, if that is really true, then we're living in a very limited universe with very limited places to go. So I tend to not believe that. Uh, I'm more optimistic myself, and uh, even though uh, I often get frustrated uh, when I see the limitations that science imposes upon uh, paraphysical realities, um, I, I still think that at some point uh, we will have the scientific underpinning, the accepted scientific underpinning for all of that. Uh, and this has certainly affected the nature of my work. Uh, I'm an experiencer from childhood. I've had all kinds of experiences. And for me, I knew they were real. No one uh, had to, no one could tell me that my experiences were not real. I knew they were real. And uh, so it puzzled me as I got older that uh, the playing field is very uneven. Uh, there's unevenness in the kinds of experiences people have and how they experience. It's not uniform. Not everybody has the same experiences in the same way. We have patterns. Uh, and then we have the doubters and the skeptics who immediately want to debunk and tear down and deny. So uh, I've always been interested, uh, my truth has been in, in my research, uh, the how and why of experiences and how people are transformed by that. And uh, that's where a lot, of, a, a lot of these fields wind up pushing out the frontiers, whether it's uh, paranormal, ufology, metaphysics. Uh, mystical philosophies is is in we, we have to take our experiences whether they're subjective or whether we have even tiny pieces of hard evidence and um, examine how and why we have them and there are patterns that have existed throughout human history and uh, more important what are we going to do with that experience how are we going to be changed by it does it change our worldview our fundamental beliefs um, is it the nature of our consciousness that has changed? How is daily life uh, changing? Um, that's where the individual is, winds up being the one really pushing out the frontiers um, through subjective experience. And uh, people are having these experiences regardless of what religion and science have to say about it. Uh, they can deny uh, all they want, but that doesn't change the fact that human beings every day have extraordinary experiences that take them into other realities. Now you're involved right now in collecting information from experiencers, and, and I think you told me it's one of the largest studies of its kind. Tell us about what's happening with that. It is the largest study to date of extraordinary experiencers, and uh, this has been conducted by the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Experiences, which isn't very old. Uh, to, I, I came on, on board on the Board of Directors and Research Committee last year. Uh, the first formation meetings were in 2013. And uh, it's a, a nonprofit educational organization that uh, wants to further our understanding of uh, how we are experiencing these other realities. So we have conducted a global survey of experiencers uh, with 2,750 respondents, which is far more than any other survey in these fields uh, that has been done to date. And even though a lot of the questions, over 600 questions, focus on uh, ET experiences, uh, we are relating those experiences across the board to uh, mysterious creature encounters, angels, fairies, ghosts, uh, demonic experiences, uh, mystical experiences, communication with the dead in the afterlife, um, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and uh, we're finding, of course, a, a lot of correlation between um, ET experiences and NDEs. There's a lot of similarities in terms of what happens and the, and the kinds of uh, ways people are changed by it. Uh, and uh, it's, this is a four-phase survey, and we've just released publicly the results from the first two phases. And uh, some of the, uh, the conclusions of the study are really quite interesting in terms of the profile of the experiencer. Now, the, the skeptics and the debunkers would like to portray experiencers, no, no matter whether it's NDE or especially ET, 
um, that these are odd people. Uh, they're fringe people. Um, they're they're not the average person. Uh, there's some element of, of uh, feeling like they're chosen in some way. When in fact, the survey shows that, that the profile of the experiencer is the average person, it's mass society. And not only that, that experiences often do start very early in life and they, they cover a variety of phenomena and experiences, not just one single one. And that many people have just simply kept quiet about it most of their lives or kept it within their families. Uh, out of fear of ridicule or uh, because all the attention in the media goes to a certain end of the spectrum and uh, they just quietly live their lives trying to puzzle these things out. Oftentimes they have nowhere to go for information or help tr to understand their experiences. So it's good to get this information out into the open and we have st statisticians, academics, scientists, medical uh, experts, uh, a whole ver uh, field researchers like myself participating in uh, analyzing and publishing this data. So now in the, in the next two phases, phase three and four, we're going more into the qualitative aspects of experiences. We want quantitative data and we also want qualitative data. And so we're going back to the data pool, which is now closed, to ask uh, open-ended questions rather than multiple choice questions. And uh, then we'll also be interviewing some of those people, uh, those who wish to come forward and be interviewed uh, to tell the details about their experiences and how they have integrated them into life. No one has done this on the scale that we're doing it to date. Are you going to be doing any like, um, like physical testing as well? Uh, it's under consideration. Psych evaluations, uh, lie detector tests, you know, those kind of things? Well, it's under consideration. We have psychologists and, and psychiatrists. We have academically and clinically trained people on board who are uh, composing the questions for the surveys and analyzing the results. And uh, we're asking people also to uh, specify how their experience took place. We had quite a bit of debate as to whether or not we would include uh, hypnotic regression mainly because of the controversy over how sure. regressions can be uh, manipulated by the wrong kind of questioning. Uh, so uh, we're of course most interested in conscious awareness experiences, mm -hmm. but we're also considering lucid dreams, um, astral projection like out of body sure. experiences. And um, I think a lot of it's going to depend on uh, the data that comes in and as we further sift through it and uh, then uh, start creating a strategy for how can we um, probe this data on a deeper level. Uh, this is a very new organization of course and we're still seeking sources of funding Sure. and that's going to depend on what we're able to do as well. So you're, you're happy with the level of scientific oversight <clears throat> that you're bringing to the table with this study? Yes, and in fact, we do have around the world, we have um, uh, very high level scientific and academic help from many sources around the world. Um, some of these individuals, and here we get back to this, this whole prejudice uh, professionally against uh, these kinds of inquiries, some of these individuals are having to help us very quietly without their names being involved. Wow. And that's, that's very unfortunate. But don't you look forward to the day when that's not the case? <laughs> I, I look forward Maybe to the day when, when this done, is liberated, you know, it. when this yeah. field really is liberated from that kind of prejudice. But, um, for example, Edgar Mitchell was very involved in the formation of this organization. We have Dr. Rudy Schild on board, astrophysicist. Uh, we have uh, uh, John Klimo, who's uh, clinically trained uh, in the uh, psychological end of things, uh, all kinds of academics, um, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful mix uh, that's come together. We have a research committee, we have a support team of clinically trained therapists who uh, provide support to experiencers. So it's really coming together in quite a nice way. And how we want to put this information out to the public uh, is not only just through a website and through making the data available. It's available now. You can down, uh, researchers can download the data and start going through it. Where and, would they do that? Is there a uh, website? 
the website is uh, it's still under construction, but there is some available on the website. We also have a Facebook page with mm -hmm. links on it to oh, cool. download this information. It's a mass of information, hundreds and hundreds of pages sure. that uh, we have uh, done up in pie charts with a breakdown in statistics, as well as background information in terms of how the study was undertaken. And m my hope and my belief are that this information will be very valuable to researchers in all fields. Um, I believe that this is going to cause us to ask different questions, mm -hmm. to evaluate things in different ways. And uh, so we also have a book and a documentary um, uh, under, I mean, in the works, uh, underway. Uh, and uh, I think that um, it's also going to influence public perception too, because the public uh, the way the media has treated the experiencer, it's, it's um, compartmentalized experiencers, and yes. some of them get marginalized. Marginalized is a, is a kind way of yeah. saying it, yeah. So this study sounds like it actually really breaks some new ground and establish some new guidelines for further research. It's, uh, it's the kind of work that goes beyond just talking about it and goes beyond speculation. It's like, let's get to the bottom of it. It's the kind of work that makes history. Well, it, it's, uh, it's hard data about subjective experience. And of course, one of the things that I found very interesting in my work is um, the, the patterns that emerge. That, uh, again, it's not, uh, not something that science would accept as hard proof. Right. But we have patterns of experiences that have been very consistent throughout humanity. So why is that? What are we encountering? Why are we encountering it? We tend to put different labels on it throughout history these types of experiences and even the types of beings that we're encountering. And uh, I think there's a common ground there somewhere. Um, we need to keep um, opening, opening yet another curtain, you know, uh, to try and, and get to the truth. But this is quite exciting. Sadly, I must say, uh, there are researchers in the field who have automatically dismissed a, a survey like this as, oh, well, uh, there have been other surveys, you know. Um, we don't need another survey. Uh, let's go look for the nuts and bolts. Where's that crashed UFO? And um, if they want to focus on certain areas in their research, I guess that's it. You know, mm -hmm. there will always be researchers like this. But um, I would hope that uh, the researchers who are the Renaissance researchers right. and, uh, will realize that this data is very valuable to helping to understand this complex, interconnected, big picture. The complex, interconnected big picture is, I think, far more profound than our little puny human minds are ever going to be able to grasp. Um, but I can't think of any other thing to focus your energy on while you're here in this place, is figuring out that we're in a matrix and figuring out how to puzzle our way back out of it. And on that note, I'd like to call the end of the conversation. I really appreciate you coming. And Thank you, Ron. talk. If you like what we're doing, subscribe here on YouTube. If you'd like to go deeper, see more original content, all commercial free, go to evolvetv.com and become a subscriber. We're repurposing the purpose of media, and we want you to join us.